Are you saved? Are you sure? How sure are you? Well, your preacher told you. Your preacher told you you were saved. Ah, but is your preacher telling you the truth? Let's find out. All right, let's go to let's go to Matthew. Now, I want to talk to you about truth because the last video I talked to you about truth. Why it's important to make sure you get every word in the scripture accurate and correctly. Ah. These twelve. Does it? Is that Jesus right there? I have friends that tell me that um, the King James version was was translated by men with the Holy Spirit. Really? Why then did they um, put a non-Hebrew name in place of a Hebrew name for a Hebrew Messiah? Hmm? Why did they do that? When right here it says Jesus or, Yeho or, or Joshua, the name of the Messiah. Also three other Israelites. Which three other Israelites? The Greek form of Joshua? Oh, well, look what we have here. Yehoshua contracted to Joshua? Don't mess with his name. Let me show you why. I told you his name was Yehoshua. And many others have said so as well. Yehoshua sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the cities of the Samaritans. Don't enter there. But go to the law sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is near. Or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Jehovah is Yehoshua. Okay. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Well, that kind of um, puts your preacher in jeopardy, doesn't it? They don't give freely. Oh, no. They take freely. They take your money. They don't obey the words of Yehoshua. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Well, they do more than that. They ride around in big fancy cars and jet airplanes, don't they? Do they have a script? Do they plan out their... Well, it says no script for your journey. Or, I mean, I guess that means no, oh, no, okay, no leather pouch for your journey. Wow. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor even, even a staff. You go to these places empty. This is what the disciples were supposed to do. Now, I'm not a preacher. I'm just pointing out scripture that everyone can learn on their own in their own house more than any other generation that has ever been and I'm showing you today how to do this how you can access this information now let's go here verse 16 Look, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and will scourge you in their synagogue. So in this verse 17 is talking about what the, uh, the Jewish elders were going to do to them. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake.
Okay. For a testimony, a witness against them, that's the kings and the governors, and against the Gentiles. What? When they deliver you up, take no thought on how you shall speak, for it shall be given to you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speaks, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. Yeah, I've heard people talk about uh, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as the king Nebuchadnezzar called them. And I have heard people say that they could have used a different method of speaking to the king and not have um, provoked the king to anger so much. Well, it was the spirit of truth that was speaking within those three friends of Daniel. Think about that. And brother shall deliver up brother to death, and father to child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And it shall come to pass to hate of every on the account of my name. You'll be hated on the account of my name. Interesting, huh? Even Christians today hate his name. Changing it to a different name so that it could be more palatable, palatable to their The Jewish uh, hate, hate, hatred of the Jewish ways. But he that endures, or he that waits to the end, yeah, to the seventh trumpet, will be saved. No, you're not saved. Who told you you were saved? It's time for a little bit of uh, fairy tale stories, if you will. The Emperor's New Clothes. Now, folks in my generation should know this particular story well. Unfortunately, the millennial generation has probably never heard of it. And even the uh, the folks before them probably never heard of it. Y generation, the X generation. Written by, of all people, a Danish author, Hans Christian Andersen. About two weavers who promise an emperor a new suit of clothes that they say is invisible to those who are unfit for their position, stupid or incompetent, while in reality, they make no clothes at all, making everyone believe that the clothes are invisible to them. When the emperor parades before his subjects in his new clothes, no one dares to say that they do not see any suit of clothes on him for fear that they will be seen as stupid. Finally, a child cries out, but he isn't wearing anything at all. The tale has been translated into 100 languages. The plot. A vain emperor who cares too much about wearing and displaying clothes hires two weavers who claim to make the most beautiful clothes in elaborate patterns. The weavers are con men. That's what your preachers are. Con men. Who convince the emperor that they are using a fine fabric invisible to anyone who is either unfit for his position or hopelessly stupid, the con lies in the fact that the weavers are actually only pretending to manufacture clothes. Thus, no one, not even the emperor nor his ministers, can see the alleged clothes. But they all pretend. That's you. You pretend. And of course, get angry when somebody points out the truth. 
And usually that someone is a little child, so to speak. But they all pretend that they can for fear of appearing unfit for their positions. Finally, the weaver report that the suit is finished and they mime dressing the emperor who then marches in procession before his subjects. The town folk uncomfortably go along with the pretense not wanting to appear unfit for their positions or stupid. Finally, a child in the crowd blurts out that the emperor is wearing nothing at all, and the cry is then taken up by others. The emperor realizes the assertion is true, but continues the procession. So are you going to um, continue in the lie, and then turn around and be con men? Just like your preacher. You don't even know what the word salvation means. You don't even know where it came from, do you? And I'll tell you why. Because once again, your preacher, the con man, told you in his own words, the New Testament is no longer relevant. I wonder if I should... Um, or the Old Testament, I should say, they, they say is no longer relevant. Let's see who claims this. I'll go to Google. I haven't I haven't looked it up, but you know, some of my friends they love to tell me that the old old testament is no longer relevant. Let's see. Here we go. This might be right. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Let's see what this thing says. The Old Covenant is over. The Old Testament is authoritative. Hmm. All right, so I guess what this particular... And they all look at this. They all had the donate button up there. You see that? Uh, no, you probably don't see it because my face is up there. So I'll, I'll pull it down so you can see it. See this? Yeah, they, they all have your donate button out there. Very, very interesting. All right. So he goes, Andy Stanley's claim that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament has created quite a splash, and he defends his view in a new book, Irresistible, reclaiming that the new that Jesus unleashed for the world. Notice how they do not want to have anything to do with the name Yehoshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. And this is the reason why he said anyone who is would be ashamed of me, uh, he will be ashamed. Uh, he will be ashamed of that person before his father. Now. So, the, the Old Covenant has passed away in all its entirety, Stanley argues. In his blog post, Jesus the ended the Old Covenant once and for all. Well, he fulfilled, he fulfilled it. Okay, Yehoshua did, not Jesus. He quotes me in support of his view, uh, argues that the entirety of the law has been set aside now that, as he says, Christos, but it's Moshiach, Messiah in English, has come to say that the moral elements of the law continue to be authoritative, blunts the truth, 
that the entire Mosaic Covenant is no longer in force for believers. He ends the post by saying, we don't treat the others based upon the Ten Commandments, but on the law of love, the love that he says expressed for his disciples. Okay. Let's have a look then. Um, Matthew 5. I think it's here. Okay. I just look. Don't you love how uh, King James Version puts these subtitles on here? You know, some of them are correct and some of them are not. So let's go to Strong's Concordance. Yehoshua fulfills the law. Think not that I have come to destroy the Torah, is what it should read. Or the prophets. Why would he have to say that? Because he knew that there would be people. He knew that there would be people in the last days that would say that he came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. The words of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in any way pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the lesser commandments. Why? Because if you break the lesser commandments, you break the greater ones. So Yehoshua set a template that was a slightly different from Moses' template. Moses' template was the Ten Commandments. Yehoshua's template was love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Well, I believe it was James or John who pointed out the reason why. One of the lesser commandments, and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom, but whosoever shall do them and teach the same shall be called great in the kingdom. Because I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no case enter in the kingdom of the sky. It was coming down on Jerusalem. So what was the what what the, what what was the problem that he had with the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, they didn't take Jehovah's name in vain. They didn't bow down and worship graven images. They didn't physically break the Sabbath. But the other commandments, they failed on. And this is how they taught. So Yehoshua flipped the script and said this. The lesser commandments, keep those. Right? And then he goes line by line by line. You heard of old time, you shall not kill. Guess what? That commandment still applies. Whosoever shall kill, murder, is liable 
of judgment. You will be, how do I put this? Once you're liable of the judgment, in other words, that's the, in modern day terminology, you will, you will be summoned to the court to answer for what you've done. That's a guarantee. But I say unto you, So, so okay, so in those days, whoever commits murder uh, will be brought to, the, brought to the magistrate to answer for. Okay, but I say unto you, he says unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is going to be in danger, held liable. Of judgment if you are even angry with your brother without a cause you know like because that's what leads to murder folks and whosoever shall say to brother I don't know what Racha means it's an expression of contempt shall be in danger held liable of the council shall be liable of the council or liable of the Sanhedrin. I think what it means is in those days those who called his brother an, a, a, an expression of contempt, racha, they were in those days in danger of the Sanhedrin. Okay. Whosoever shall say to his brother, you fool, shall be in danger or shall be bound, bound by hellfire or Gehenna fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has aught against you, has anything against you. Forget your gift. Leave your gift before the altar and go back and be reconciled to your brother because that's more important, reconciliation. And then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, with your opponent quickly, or be agreeable, be accommodating. While you're in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast into prison, verily I say unto you, you shall by no means come out until you have paid the uttermost penny. So this is anger and reconciliation. This is about dealing with your brother. Murder, lying, etc. Adultery, you have heard it said of them in old time, you should not commit adultery, but I say unto you, he that looks upon a woman to lust after her commits adultery already within her in his heart. If your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and that your whole body should not be cast into Gehenna. And if your right hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and not the whole body. Divorce. Oh, this one. Christians really love this one. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let her, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication, causes her, you cause her to commit adultery. If you, if you divorce your wife with the exception, with exception of the fact that she was fooling around with another man, <laughs> what she does in the future is on you. And whoever shall marry her and is divorced or released commits adultery with her. And you have heard it been said in the old time, you shall not forswear yourself. But you shall perform unto Jehovah your oaths. But I say unto you, don't swear at all. 
No, not even in the courtroom. Neither by heaven because it belongs to Jehovah, nor it is his throne, nor by the earth because it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or one hair black, and you cannot but let your communication be yes or no, because whatever comes after that, whatever is added to yes or no, only comes from evil. Love your enemies. You have heard it being said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you uh, withstand not evil. But whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn, turn, turn the other to him also. And if anyone will sue you at, in the court of law to take away your coat, offer him your cloak also. He's saying, don't let it go to court. Settle with him. And whosoever shall compel you to walk a mile with him, go with him too. Give to anyone that asks you, and from him you, that would borrow of you, turn you not away. You've heard it being said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. See, this is what um, the ancient Anabaptists did. That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain upon the just and upon the unjust. For if you love them that love you, what what reward are, are you going to have? Uh, the, the tax collectors do the same, and if it's you salute your brethren also, what have you done more than others? Because the tax collectors do the same thing. Be ye therefore perfect, because your Father in heaven is perfect. So these are the commandments. They are even more stringent than the Ten Commandments, folks. And so when this man says, what did he say here? Where was this? Okay, to say that the moral elements of the law continue to be authoritative blunts of truth that the entire Mosaic Covenant is no longer in force for believers. Well, see, it says he ends the post by saying, we don't treat others based upon the Ten Commandments, but upon the law of love. The love, as he claims, Jesus expressed to his disciples. Okay. No, the law that Yehoshua delivered in Matthew 5. This is the Torah or I should say, having the Torah in your inward parts. This is circumcision of the heart. That's what this is, what we read here. All right? So, going back to being saved, You see, the notion, are you saved, at right now, what it does do, it eliminates the possibility of Israel being saved at the last trumpet. Because if you go, if you go to Romans 11, If you go to Romans 11, right. it goes on and talks about the ingrafting of the Gentiles and how the Gentiles may not boast against the branches because they're grafted in amongst the branches and share with Israel. In other words, they are partners with Israel.
the branches of Israel. It says it all through. I've done. I've gone over this so many times. All right. Right here in verse 21, it says, If Jehovah spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not you. Look at the severity and the goodness of Jehovah on them which fell severity. This That was at 70 A.D. But toward you goodness, but only if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you too shall be cut off. And they also, if they, not if they, this word is not if, it says before. Before they believe. See, these wording in here is that they're doing uh, double negatives here. Before they abide not still in unbelief. That's a double negative. So, before they believe. Take away the double negative here and say before they believe because a double negative is a positive. Before they abide not Okay. Oh, look at here. It says before twice. Before before they stay on before unbelief. Before unbelief. That means they believe, they believe. So so the Greek, and, and the Greek translated from what Paul was speaking, he was saying, before they believe, before, before they believe, they will be grafted in because Jehovah is able to graft them in again. Exactly as it is written in uh, Ezekiel 39, I believe it's in verse 12 and, and onward. When... When Israel sees the hand that Jehovah has laid upon the Gentiles when they attack Israel, they will know Jehovah from that day and forward, not from that day and backwards. So that kind of puts into question the uh, much of Christianity, much of Protestant Christianity's uh, doctrine of salvation. And he said, Let's see. Because he's going to graft them again. Because if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and uh, against nature, into a good olive tree, how much greater an opportunity will these have of the natural branches to be grafted into their own olive tree? Yeah. So some Romans, some Gentiles were indeed grafted in. And that means Israel is going to be, 12 tribes of Israel are going to be grafted back in again. And all Israel shall be saved. You see, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. Well, the story of the emperor's new clothes. What was his crime? What was his... What was he, yeah, what was his error? He was wise in his own conceit. And the con men used that against him to pilfer his money. Are you wise in your own conceit? Do you believe that you're saved already? If you believe that you are saved already, you are indeed wise in your own conceit and you're being pilfered just like the emperor and the emperor's new clothes. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in or as it is written in Luke 12, Um, I believe it's in Luke 12. Could be. Yeah, I think it's in Luke. It could be Luke 21. Hold on. 
Yeah, it's in Luke 21. Sorry, I got my ones and twos mixed up. Um, so, Luke 21 and verse 20, it says, When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies by Titus, the Roman general, I know there are those of you who are so deluded you don't believe that that was Jerusalem's persecution, that that was Jerusalem's tribulation. It was. Then you shall know its desolation is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains for them that were, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let none that are in the rural areas go into the city. Because these are the days of vengeance. Vengeance of all. On who? Vengeance upon that generation of Jews. Those are the days of vengeance upon them. That all the things which are written where in the prophets will be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they will be led captive into all the Goi, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles. And it still is. You still have the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Orthodox uh, cathedrals, the Catholic cathedrals, all dotting Jerusalem. So the time of the Gentiles has not been complete, done, finished with yet. But it will be. What happens when the time of the Gentiles is finished, fulfilled? Romans 11. Until the time of the Gentiles comes to an end is what it should say. And so all Israel shall be saved when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end. See, salvation came to the Gentiles when, essentially, when Jerusalem came to an end. But the time of the Gentiles is coming to an end, and when that happens, all Israel shall be saved. Nobody's going to be saved until Israel is saved. In fact, if we read in Revelation, Revelation 10, verse 7, I believe. But in the verse, yeah, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Jehovah should be finished or accomplished. As he fin as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Which prophets? Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 49, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Zechariah 9, Zechariah 14, Zechariah 12. I might as well just say all of Zechariah. Was there any prophet at all? Even Moses, Deuteronomy 30. as he declared to his servants the prophets. So it's going to be in the days of the seventh trumpet. Joel 2. Joel 2. Even more proof. Strong's. All right.
Verse 30, I will show wonders in, in the sky and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of not the Lord, Jehovah. Come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall proclaim the name of Jehovah, not the Lord, shall be delivered or saved. When? When the day of Jehovah's wrath begins. Right when the trumpet, seventh trumpet, is beginning to sound. Because in Mount Zion, you know, the one in Jerusalem, that one, don't try, don't try to water down the truth, folks, and call it spiritualization. Don't fall victim to the con men. Don't be that emperor in the, in the book, The Emperor's New Clothes. In Mount Zion shall be an escape. That's where you escape to. As Jehovah has uttered, has promised the words, the logos that came out of his mouth. And the survivors whom Jehovah shall call, or the survivors who call Jehovah. That may be what this means. You see, whosoever shall proclaim the name of Jehovah in the remnant who call or who proclaim Jehovah. Do you proclaim Jehovah? You say you're saved? Well, you're not. I'm not saved yet. I'm not going to be saved until Israel is saved at the time of the end. You don't want to be the one walking around with no clothes, do you? That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Don't listen to the con men, your preachers. Don't give them your money. No, you're not saved. None of us is. Not until the seventh trumpet begins to sound. 